In her history, the Brazilian Grand Prix moved from Interlagos to the tough and demanding 3.1-mile circuit at the Rio Autodrome. Tough and demanding because it's bumpy, because it embraces a sinuous 11-corner section and because the main straight is nearly three-quarters of a mile long. So it's a real test for the cars and a real test for the drivers because although it's wet, it's really hot and humid at Rio. After Alan Jones's superb victory at Long Beach, the reigning world champions leading this year's contest ahead of his teammate Carlos Reutemann. And Long Beach was the third consecutive first and second places for the same two drivers in the Williams team, an all-time Grand Prix record. Well, it's harmonious enough on the driver front, but there's not much brotherly love amongst the constructors, for again the contentious Lotus 88's been protested and excluded for allegedly breaking the painfully evolved new car design rules. And in spite of all the talk about the imminent dominance of turbocharged cars, it hasn't happened yet. For once again, the astounding Ford Cosworth V8 engine is powering most of the practice leaderboard cars. For in pole position, it's Nelson Piquet, the new hero of Brazil. Eight seconds inside Carlos Reutemann's 1978 Ferrari lap record. Then in his Saudi Leyland Williams on the right, it's Reutemann himself three times winner at Brazil. World champion Alan Jones on the left is third Third fastest, 23 starters, 63 laps, and that's 197 miles. And watch for the red light, and then shortly after it, the green, and it will be go for the 63-lap Brazilian Grand Prix. And it's a superb start for Carlos Reutemann and for Ricardo Patrese and Alan Jones. And they've all got ahead of the pole place man, Nelson Piquet, who is in fourth position, number five, as they go into the first corner, the swinging right-hander. And this is an anti-clockwise clock course. And it's Reutemann leading Patrese and number 21, Chico Serra, the Brazilian, has already spun out of the race. And now they'll have to get his car off the circuit. Reutemann leading on lap one. The Argentine driver in his 131st Grand Prix. And look again at the start. A superb start by Reutemann. Patrese coming up on the right. Jones on the left. And Piquet drops back. And there is the Alfa Romeo in the background as we rejoin the race to see Reutemann leading Patrese. And Alan Jones has closed right up on the Italian. And it was Riccardo Patrese, don't forget, who led at Long Beach, the last Grand Prix, until about 30 laps into it when his engine had trouble with the fuel feed and he had to drop out of the race. So, Reutemann in the Saudi Leyland Williams car leading Patrese in the orange and white arrows, followed immediately by Alan Jones, the reigning world champion, in the white Saudi Leyland team car with his teammate Carlos Reutemann accelerating away. And you can see how bad the conditions are here at Rio because the great rooster tails of spray coming up from the big rear tires of the cars. Alan Jones moves out to his left to avoid that spray and get a clear view of the circuit. And Alan Jones is through ahead of Patrese. Alan Jones is up into second place. So again, and we've seen it so many times recently in Grand Prix, it is the Williams cars first and second. There's Jones second ahead of Ricardo Patrese. As ever, an enormous crowd, and that is Patrick Tombay, the Frenchman who finished in sixth place at Long Beach in the new Theodore car, backed by Teddy Yip. He's spun off, but he's driving back onto the circuit as we rejoin and we see again this oh-so-familiar sight. Reutemann, Jones, and behind them in third position, Riccardo Patrese, and these three are already even in this early start at stage of the race, pulling away from the battle behind them for fourth position. And as I talk to you, it's Elio De Angelis, the Lotus team driver who is in fourth position, with Bruno Giacomelli in the Alfa Romeo in fifth position, ahead of Keki Rosberg. And there are the first five or six cars coming down the straight, 
Reutemann moves across to his right to get the racing line, and that's Eddie Cheever in the Tyrrell, who has stalled on the circuit. It'll be interesting to see whether he gets going again. Very demanding circuit, this, like most of the Grand Prix circuits. This one, though, is bumpy. It hasn't been used since 1978 because the Brazilian Grand Prix was held at Interlagos, which is near Sao Paulo, the home of the 1972 and 74 world champion Emerson Fittipaldi, whose place as the hero of Brazil has been taken in this race by Nelson Piquet and Chico Serra, Nelson Piquet's countryman and Fittipaldi's countryman, started the race and is already out of it, as you saw earlier on. So Reutemann, from another South American country, the Argentine, leads. Jones, second, Patrese, third. And it would seem, and it's always dangerous to make a prophecy in car racing, and certainly in a Grand Prix as early as this, but it would seem that already the two Williams cars are stamping their dominance on the Brazilian Grand Prix. They have already recently broken a Grand Prix, an all-time World Championship motor racing record because these same two drivers have finished first and second in the last three Grand Prix. The last three World Championship point-scoring Grand Prix because Alan Jones won at Long Beach with Reutemann second. Reutemann won in South Africa this year, but it didn't count for World Championship points. Alan Jones won at Watkins Glen in 1980, the last race of the year, and 21 there is Chico Serra's car. And as I prophesied, it's been manhandled off the course. And I was saying that Reutemann had finished in second place to Jones at Watkins Glen, as he did at uh, Canada last year, and that's a record. The same two drivers, first and second in three successive World Championship point-scoring Grand Prix, an incredible record. Not just a testimony to the drivers, but to the incredible reliability of their cars. Reutemann leads. Jones second. Look for the flash of the orange car. There it is. Ricardo Patrese in third position. And those three a long, long way ahead of Lotus team leader, young Elio De Angelis, just 22 years old. And we'll be seeing him later. There's, there's De Angelis. You just saw him approaching the corner as Reutemann and Jones accelerated out down the street into the right-hander again. And now it's just a case for Reutemann of keeping up his rhythm, this tremendously experienced 38-year-old Argentine driver. Indeed, next to Mario Andretti, the American, Reutemann is the oldest driver in this race with a quite incredible record here at Brazil because Carlos won in 1972. It was not actually a world championship point scoring race then, but he won in 1977 and then he won again in 1978 here at Rio, and then he was in the Ferrari team. He left Ferrari and went to Lotus. Then last year he left Lotus and went to Williams. And now for the fourth time he's leading the Brazilian Grand Prix and looking well on it. And who's that? That is Villeneuve. That's Gilles Villeneuve doing in the Brazilian Grand Prix what you will recall Jacques Lafitte, the Frenchman, did just a couple of weeks ago or so at Long Beach, crumpling up the front of his car and with five laps completed out of 63, there is the race order indicating that Bruno Giacomelli is in fifth place in the Alfa Romeo and Keki Rosberg, the Finnish driver, in sixth position in the Fittipaldi car. And Villeneuve now into the pits, obviously to have a new nose section fitted because there's no reason why the car should not be a good runner once a new section's been put on the nose. But he will be well adrift, he will have lost a good lap and be right down the order. Whereas as Jones and Reutemann ahead of him go past Serra's car, parked by the side of the road, they are very, very much in command. And there's either Guerra, the South American driver, in the Osella, or one of the Ferraris ahead of Reutemann. 
and from the look of it, it's an Arcella. Just caught a flash of the maroon car as Reutemann and Jones driving round implacably in team order. But there's an interesting sidelight on what we're looking at now. Carlos Reutemann, notwithstanding his enormous experience and the fact that he has won, yes, it's an Arcella that they're passing, it's Angel Guerra. Notwithstanding the fact that Reutemann, with all his experience and 11 Grand Prix victories behind him, as has his teammate Alan Jones, is actually the number two driver and the number two contracted driver in the Williams team. And there is a clause in his contract which says if at the closing stages of a Grand Prix, and that's Hector Ribach, the Mexican driver, in the Parmalat Brabham car with the Ford Cosworth V8 engine. Presumably coming in to change tyres as coming towards us now goes Ricardo Zunino, the Argentine driver, who is being closed up on by another Argentine driver and this time it's the man who's leading the race, Carlos Reutemann. Reutemann passes. Jones comes out of the slipstream of Guerra as Reutemann gives the driver behind him a real face full of spray and water and Alan Jones closes up and goes past him too. So it's just a case now of the two Williams drivers maintaining their rhythm and I was explaining that Carlos Reutemann has got a clause in his contract which says if at the closing stage of a Grand Prix he is less than 10 seconds ahead of Alan Jones. In other words, if Alan Jones is rather less than 10 seconds behind Reutemann, then Reutemann must move over and let Alan Jones through to win. 10 laps completed, Patrese still third, De Angelis fourth, Rosberg in fifth position, and now John Watson in sixth place. And we're looking down now at John Watson as the picture changes and Watson has got ahead of Rosberg. So there is the battle for fifth and sixth position. John Watson in fifth place now in the red and white Marlborough car, followed by, there goes Rosberg, and behind Rosberg, it's one of the two Talbot Matra cars, the blue and white car, and it's probably Jacques Lafitte ahead of his countryman, Jean-Pierre Jarrier, both of them in the Talbots with the V12 Matra engines, only their second Grand Prix. Long Beach was the first. Watson. Rosberg and it's Jean-Pierre Gerrier behind him and behind Gerrier is Mark Sura. Mark Sura, the Swiss driver, the third of these three cars as Watson comes towards us, then Rosberg, behind Rosberg is Gerrier and behind Gerrier there is Mark Sura. Now this is interesting, Mark Sura the Formula 2 champion of Europe of 1979 in a march went to the ATS Formula 1 team last year, crashed very badly at South Africa, broke both his legs, came back into racing at the tail end of last season in the ATS, and as Jarrier, jumper Jarrier, the Frenchman challenges and passes Keki Rosberg and moves up into fifth position in the process. Sura closes up on Rosberg. Now, Sura has recovered from his leg injuries, joined the Ensign team. Now, watch this replay as Jarrier comes out of Rosberg's slipstream at just the right moment to tuck into the inside line. Rosberg has to move out and give way, closes in behind Jarrier's rear aerofoil, and in the process has lost time and speed, which enables Mark Sura to close right up with him. But back at the front, or rather up at the front, Carlos Reutemann still leads you. You'll notice he's got the rear light of his car on. All these Formula One Grand Prix drivers are obliged by the rules to have a rear light which can be switched on by the driver. And we're looking at Rosberg and Sura now. Sura right up with Rosberg. Rosberg has been passed, just if you remember, there's the Matt Talbot of Jarier. Now Sura, who's driving a terrific race, because the Ensign 
was certainly in last season not the fastest by a long chalk of the Formula One Grand Prix cars. Last year it was driven initially by Clay Rigazzoni who crashed so tragically at Long Beach and then it was taken over by Jan Lammers, the Dutch driver. And now it's Mark Sura in the cockpit of the ensign and really challenging Keki Rosberg and moving up into the World Championship scoring points position because you get points for first, second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth places in the championship. Coming towards us, that's Pironi in the Ferrari. Then Watson, then Jarier, and now Sura is challenging Rosberg. And he's going to go through, is he? That's where Jarier went through. No, Rosberg closes the door very firmly in the Swiss driver's face. That's number 14, Mark Sura, in the red, white and blue ensign, very patriotically painted, because it's very much a British car. Whereas the Fittipaldi car in front of him, of course, is owned by Emerson Fittipaldi and it's very much on its home circuit, although the car was built in Britain. So, Brazilian money behind this white car, built in Britain, driven by a Finnish driver. And there, Reutemann again, just to take us back to our yardstick, as it were, our locating point for the race, the man at the front, number two, Carlos Reutemann. Man who's done just about everything. He's driven for Brabham, he's driven for Ferrari, he's driven for Lotus, he's driven for Williams. Third in the 1980 World Championship, Carlos Reutemann, and first at Monaco last year. Man with more experience in Grand Prix than anyone, including Mario Andretti, who is older than him. And Bruno Giacomelli, young Bruno Giacomelli, the Italian, comes into the pits in the V12 Alfa Romeo, out of the running now. Whatever the problem was, it's put him down the field. And he was, you will remember, in fifth place earlier on. About eight laps into the race, he was in fifth position. Now, Chivas got going again. This blue car, number four, as behind him, Elio De Angelis is moving up through the field. This is the young 22-year-old Italian driver in the Lotus 81, not, I remind you, the Lotus 88, the extremely controversial twin chassis car, which for the second race in succession has been excluded, and now there is Elio De Angelis in the Lotus, punching his way past, going through, taking the corner line again, as Carlos Reutemann now comes through. Now, it'll be interesting to see how far Alan Jones is behind him, because Alan, like Carlos Reutemann, and Alan is only in his 83rd Grand Prix, so he's a comparative newcomer in comparison with uh, Carlos Reutemann. There is Jones, that's the gap. So Alan Jones is being very careful to keep well in sight of Carlos, far enough back to avoid that that's a good that gives you a perfect indication of the relative positions of the two cars and you will see that on the wet track Alan Jones is keeping well back out of Carlos Reutemann's spray giving himself as clear a drive as he can but yet staying well in touch with the race leader So, some 40 minutes into this race, which will last, I would estimate, quickly working things out in my head, because they're doing very much slower lap times than they did uh, in practice. And there is Pironi, followed by Rosberg, followed by Alain Prost, followed by Gerrier. So things have really hotted up behind Carlos Reutemann, the leader, Alan Jones in second place, Ricardo Patrese in fourth position, and Elio De Angelis, who is in fourth position behind Patrese, Jones and Reutemann. So, there is Peroni, there is Prost, Alain Prost, the young Frenchman in the turbocharged one and a half litre Renault, closing up on the turbocharged Ferrari of Didier Pironi, the Frenchman, 
and both of them now ahead of Keki Rosberg. Now the battle is going to be between Prost in the Turbo Renault and Pironi in the Turbo Ferrari. And this is only Pironi's second race in the Ferrari team. Pironi drove last year for the Ligier team, as it then was, and that was a replay, as you saw, of Prost passing Rosberg. Back again, Pironi in the Scarlet Ferrari, the V6 Turbo. And last year, he, at the end of the season, he announced that right at the beginning of 1980, to everybody's consternation, Pironi, the lead car here driver, had actually signed a Ferrari contract well at the beginning of the 1980 season. And so he has been in his third team now in just three years. Tyrrell, then Ligier, now Ferrari, and now Prost is going to take him. Prost is going to punch his way through, and he does it, and Pironi's lost it. Pironi's lost it, and harpoons Prost. And there's a perfect indication of how effective the catch fencing is on today's Grand Prix circuits, because both drivers look to me, yes, they're both getting out of the cars, they're both perfectly all right, and it will be an extremely angry Prost. And here's a replay, let's look at it again. Watch Pironi on the right. Prost is going through on his right, your left. Pironi loses it, the back swings out, he can't control it, Prost can't avoid him. The aerofoil of Pironi's Ferrari goes underneath Prost's car. They both spin off. The other drivers, including Keki Rosberg, keep going, of course, and they are spinning in unison across this very wet grass. Now into the catch fencing. Prost hits it first, then Pironi, rear end first. The catch fencing stops the cars very quickly indeed, and both drivers, I'm happy to tell you, are perfectly all right. And as I say, it will be an extremely angry Alain Prost, who is out of a Grand Prix, his second Grand Prix only in the Renault, for the second time, because he was punted off on the first lap, the very first corner at Long Beach, and now he's only just uh, about 40 minutes or so into this race, which I estimate will last about two hours before he's shoved off in the Brazilian Grand Prix here at Rio by Didier Pironi. And this is Carlos Reutemann leading. So the race order now, as we look at John Watson and behind him, Jarier, they are battling for fifth position. Watson in the red and white Marlboro McLaren car, because this is the M29 McLaren, not the new M30. Watson then in fifth position, Jarier's, and Sura, there's Sura, the third of these three cars in seventh position. Race order then, Carlos Reutemann, as you know, leads Alan Jones, as you know, and as we look at Jarier challenging Watson, they're battling for fifth position. In third place behind Alan Jones is Ricardo Patrese in the arrows, still going well, we haven't seen much of him. In fourth position, Elio De Angelis in the Lotus. This is the battle for fifth. And behind Jarier, who is in sixth position, is Mark Sura, and we should see him in a moment. There's Sura, and in eighth position, Jacques Lafitte, the second French driver in the Talbot Matra V12. But now, John Watson is under pressure from Jarier. John Watson, who lives at Bognor Regis in England, 109th Grand Prix this is. Chased by the experienced Frenchman Jarier, who has driven in the Shadow Formula One team, who has driven for ATS, who's driven for Lotus, who is challenging Watson who holds him off, very difficult to get past, of course, there's only one fastest line, and if you get off that fastest line, which has been cleared a bit by the tyres and made drier than the rest, and you take a chance on trying to get through, you could easily, if you get off line, hit a puddle, hit a patch of water and spin off before you know where you are. So, Watson fifth, Jarier sixth, and behind them, but closing up, is Mark Sura in the ensign in sixth position. Seventh position, I'm sorry, Mark Sura is seventh. 
And that is number 30 is Stur. It's Siegfried Stur, the man with the German name who is in fact an Italian, the second of the two Arrows drivers. The first of the two Arrows drivers, of course, Riccardo Patrese is in third position still. And Siegfried Stur, his teammate, is out of contention here in Brazil and he failed even to qualify at Long Beach, his first Grand Prix in America before this race here at Brazil. And this is certainly not a day for Bruno Giacomelli, number 23, the 28-year-old ex-European Formula 2 champion in his third season of Formula 1 in the Alfa Romeo, but seemingly out of the race from the point of view of getting a place because that's the second time we've seen Bruno Giacomelli, the young Italian, go into the pits in the Alfa Romeo. There's De Angelis, and behind De Angelis is Nelson Piquet, who started in pole position, who went down to fourth position. There is confirmation. Reutemann, Jones, Patrese, first, second and third. De Angelis, Watson and Gerrier, fourth, fifth and sixth. There's the fifth place man, Watson. As into the pits again, for the second time, comes Hector Ribac, the Mexican. And we don't have time to see what the trouble is, because back again to see Watson and Sura. Sura has got ahead of Gerrier. Mark Sura, that's Watson, and look at the next car. It's Mark Sura who has gone up a place. So Sura is now in sixth position, the second of these two cars. The blue and white cars behind him are in seventh and eighth places. Gerrier, there's Gerrier, and here is Watson who is in fifth position. So. Reutemann, Jones, Patrese, De Angelis in the Lotus, Watson that we are looking at, there he is, and behind him, closing up, is Sura. This is a magnificent race for Mark Sura, he's making his reputation here at Brazil today, and just watch the way he's harassing John Watson. Over half distance now, we're over an hour since the race started. And these cars, Watson, Sura, Jarier, Lafitte. Jarier is closing up on Sura. Sura is closing up on Watson. Watson is in fifth position. And behind all of them, about two car lengths, Jacques Lafitte in eighth position in the Talbot Matra. Fifth, sixth, seventh. Now, this is where Sura can challenge this point. He can get right up behind John Watson tuck his front aerofoil under the rear wing of John Watson's car. John Watson will see the nose of Sura's ensign looming large in his left-hand mirror on the left-hand side of the windscreen. You just see it there. And you've got to have nerves of steel to resist the pressure and not make a mistake. And John Watson's holding him off superbly. Got an enormous amount of experience, of course, Watson. And he's been harassed. In fact, I remember a Grand Prix in 1976 when John Watson and James Hunt drove round for the whole area, even closer than Sura, the second of these two cars, and Watson are now. And Watson staved Hunt off and won the race by about a car's length, as close as they are now. So Watson's got a lot of experience of resisting pressure and he's resisting it well now. And the two of them, Watson and Sura, are, are pulling away just a little from Gerrier. And just imagine what it's like for Sura, because he's driving along virtually in a solid ball of spray that's coming up from Watson's wheels, and he challenges again. And now Gerrier, because Watson went a little wide on the corner, as did Sura, Gerrier was able to take a tighter line, and the three cars, fifth, sixth, and seventh, are virtually together, and Jack Lafitte is starting to close up on Gerrier. This is terrific stuff, and I remind you that ahead of them still is Carlos Reutemann, followed by Alan Jones, followed by Rick... Ricardo Patrese in third place, and Elio De Angelis in fourth place, and we look at the battle for fifth. 
And there's Gerrier now, taking the tight line, closing up on Sura, but Sura and Watson seem to be a bit better on acceleration, whereas Gerrier closes up on braking. And now Sura is going to challenge again. John Watson, as far as one can see, quite implacable behind that rain-covered visor on the front of his helmet, which will be kept clear of spray to a great extent by the colossal wind pressure, which literally blows the water off the visor. You very seldom see a driver raise a gloved hand off the steering wheel to wipe his visor because the wind pressure does it for him. And all round this course, this terrific crowd that's turned out in spite of the dreadful weather, is witnessing a truly terrific scrap for this fifth place, which is more than you can say about first, second, third and fourth, because up in front it's pretty processional as Sura challenges again. And Gerrier stays with Sura, and they spread out across the course, and that gives Lafitte another chance to move up a bit. And the lap times are coming down. But, in spite of this terrific scrap, these four are actually slowing each other down because they are literally getting in each other's way, preventing any of them, even John Watson in front, from taking the ideal racing line. Watson will be intent on keeping the others back. The others will be intent on trying to outfumble John to make him break late, to make him miss a change gear, to make him take a wrong line on a corner, anything to pressure, pressure, pressure the Englishman. And Sura challenges again. He's going to try and go through on the inside, but, but you have to jeep right immediately after that corner, and he lost the advantage. Four cars absolutely together, the two V12 Matras in only their second Grand Prix behind and Watson slid out a bit there. That gave Sura a chance. And now Sura's going to try and go through on the inside again. But there's no way he's going to get past Watson unless Watson makes a mistake. Watson is now well in the rhythm of his racing. He knows the line exactly. He knows where Sura is going to challenge. So maybe Mark is trying to outfox Watson by showing him the nose of the ensign car at a certain place on appropriate corners and he may then change his plan and try and nip through just where John isn't expecting him to. They are absolutely on the ragged edge of adhesion, of course, now. Wet road underneath them, a film of water underneath the tyres. It's very easy to lose the car. Watson in fifth place, Sura number 14 in sixth position. Number 25, Jean-Pierre Jarrier in seventh place. And number 26, Jacques Lafitte, the fourth of the four cars that you'll see in your screen in a moment, is in eighth position. And they are closing up now on Eddie Cheever in the Tyrrell, and it may well be that there'd be a change. That's the position after 30 laps, that's just short of half distance. Watson and Sura, fifth and sixth, as I have been saying, closing up on Eddie Cheever, and it could well be that when they catch the young American driver, there could be a change of positions because they will have to time their passing manoeuvres absolutely to perfection. When you come up behind a slower driver that you're lapping, you can very easily make a mistake and let somebody through. So Watson will have to watch it as he comes up to Eddie Cheever as they go down the long, long three quarters of a mile straight. This is fifth gear, over 160 miles an hour. Just think about that. And Watson loses it! That's it, the pressure's got to him. He's kept the car going. Look, he's motoring. Now, if he'd had skirts on his car, he would have been out of the race. It would have damaged them. But immediately, John Watson, who was pressured and lost it, has gone straight down from fifth position to eighth position. What? This is a replay. Now, watch it. I'm not surprised with the pressure that Watson had. Now, watch the back end of the car swing out. A complete 360-degree turn. Watson keeps it going with the nose pointing in the right direction, and that's a brilliant bit of driving. But in the process, he has gone straight down from fifth to eighth position, 
which means to say that Mark Sura has gone up to fifth position, Gerrier to sixth, Jacques Lafitte to seventh place, and we look at number five, Nelson Piquet, the Brazilian who started on pole position in the Brabham and has actually been into the pits to change his tyres. Now, presumably, and I have to take a guess because I didn't actually see from my box his uh, pit stop. Presumably, Nelson Piquet was taking a gamble in changing tyres that the circuit was going to dry out, in which case he certainly made a wrong guess, but it's not stopping him from passing, first of all, Ricardo Zunino in the Tyrrell, and then Eddie Chiva. No, Chiva he passed first. Number four is Zunino, the leader of these two blue, unsponsored Tyrrell cars. And uh, Nelson Piquet, let's have a look at it again. He's already passed Chiva. Now he passes number four, the Argentine driver Ricardo Zunino, who was Piquet's teammate in the Brabham team last year. Piquet then on his way out of the points, and it was Nelson Piquet who finished second in the World Championship last year and who desperately needs points in this race, and he's not in the points positions at the moment because he's well below sixth position, but he desperately needs points because Carlos Reutemann and Alan Jones were respectively second and first at Long Beach, the first point scoring race of this year, and they are in, as you see, first and second places this year, and it means they're both on 15 points in the World Championship if they keep going in the positions that they're in now. And looking down from the helicopter, you can see how bad the spray is as Carlos Reutemann comes up to take Keki Rosberg, the Finnish driver, in the Fittipaldi car. Now, he's going to lap him, and Rosberg was at one stage in this race at sixth position. He's dropped right down. I don't know whether he had a spin or whether he went into the pits to change his tyres, but for whatever reason, with, uh, I would say, yes, look, quick, about 84 minutes of this race, which I expect to last, I say, about two hours, just over two hours gone. Carlos Reutemann is now right up with Keki Rosberg and is going to lap him. Just watch the lines. Rosberg will know, of course, that uh, it's Reutemann. He'll see him in his mirrors. And I would expect Rosberg, and there's Alan Jones in second place, so he's still very close. And Alan Jones has lapped Eddie Cheever as Bruno Giacomelli comes out of the pit, so he must have been in for a third time. Alan Jones then, like Reutemann, is lapping his way through the field as Reutemann comes up, and Rosberg takes a wide line, and I think actually Keki is readying himself to let uh, Carlos Reutemann through. We'll soon see. 63 laps. It hasn't been the most exciting of races at the front because, once again, it has been a, an amazing demonstration of the Saudia Leyland Williams team consistency and reliability and the, I use the word a lot, but advisedly so, brilliance of Carlos Reutemann and Alan Jones, the second and third of these two cars here. And my prophecy was wrong because Keki Rosberg does not seem to be making way willingly for Carlos Reutemann. There's Jones. That's Patrick Tombe in the white car with the high wing in the front, number 33, sixth in the race at Long Beach, the first Grand Prix scoring race of 1981. And he's now ahead of one of the Tyrrells as we look down and you get a magnificent view of this twisty but very flat Rio Autodrome circuit and the water all around it and the mountains in the background. The circuit about 20 miles away from Brazil and look at this. This is Mark Sura, the second of these two cars. Mark Sura has now closed right up with Elio De Angelis, who is in fourth position. So, Sura, having fought his way up from sixth to fifth when he went past the spinning John Watson, he moved up from sixth position into fifth position. He's now right in the spray of the fourth place man, Elio De Angelis, number 11 in the Lotus 81.
De Angelis, fourth place on the left. Sura, fifth place on the right. Sura driving the race of his life. And behind Sura, it's either Gerrier with Lafitte following him or Lafitte with Gerrier following him. I can't tell at that quick look which of the two Torbots is leading of these two cars which are the third and fourth of the cars we're looking at the moment. But there is De Angelis in fourth place in the race. There is Sura, number 14, in fifth place in the race. So, Swiss driver in English car, Italian driver in English car. Ahead of them, Riccardo Patrese in the Arrows, third position. Alan Jones in second position, Carlos Reutemann still leading the race. And it looks as though Kiki Rosberg has still not been passed by Carlos Reutemann. So Rosberg has got right back in the groove again. Ah, there's confirmation. Lap 45, no change. Those are the positions I've been giving you. Reutemann, Jones, Patrese, first, second and third places. Elio De Angelis that we're looking at now in fourth place, followed by Mark Sura in fifth place. And the two Torbots, that must be Jacques Lafitte going through up into sixth position. Yes, it is. That's the... No, it's Gerrier. Gerrier getting ahead of Jacques Lafitte and taking sixth position from his countryman and teammate, Jacques Lafitte. Meantime, the battle for fourth position continues to rage. The leaders and... We have, we've hardly seen Riccardo Patrese. Somehow or other, the cameras have consistently missed him. There's Reutemann leading Keki Rosberg. So he's now got ahead of him. And now Alan Jones is going to have to catch up with and fight his way past the finish driver. But knowing Alan, I suspect that he's not going to find it nearly as difficult to get past uh, Rosberg as Reutemann did, because... Uh, Alan Jones will brook no opposition and he will bundle his way past Keki Rosberg with no ceremony at all, I suspect. Whereas Carlos Reutemann is rather more apt with his red light shining through the spray to take it easy getting past someone in comparison with Alan Jones' teammate. We'll soon see. Reutemann. the spray coming up from Carlos Reutemann's rear wheels. And Rosberg has still not been passed by Alan Jones. All the time in Grand Prix after Grand Prix, one looks at these Williams cars and thinks, surely they can't both finish again in another Grand Prix, never mind in first and second places. Carlos Reutemann has actually broken another motor racing record because he has finished for the last 11 Grand Prix in World Championship scoring positions. And that is an absolutely amazing testimony, not only to himself as a driver, but to his team mechanics and the car's designer, everybody in the Saudi Alayla Williams team. This is uh, De Angelis, fourth, Sura fifth and Mark Sura is now starting to pressure De Angelis in exactly the same way as he pressured John Watson. I wonder if the result is going to be the same. Because John Watson certainly wasn't touched by Sura's car. There was no question of Sura accidentally nudging the Marlborough car in front of him and John Watson going off because of a push. It was uh, a clean fight. John Watson spun off. And Mark Sura, knowing that his pressurization tactics have worked once, may well be trying it again with uh, De Angelis. And that's Piquet. Piquet coasting. Looks as though his race is run. Coasting. But no, he was just coasting and dropped the clutch to get the engine going again through the rear wheels. And Piquet gets away again. And that's about 95 minutes gone now in this 120 minute or so race because no Grand Prix can last over two hours. The race has to be stopped if it runs for over two hours. 
So 120 minutes is the maximum. That was Reutemann through. Now Jones has got past Rosberg. There is Keke. There is Piquet. So Alan Jones has got ahead of Keke Rosberg in the Fittipaldi and is back in team station with Carlos Reutemann, his teammate. And I would expect to see before very much longer as we look at... Ah, that's Sura, and Sura's got ahead of De Angelis. Sura, Mark Sura has got up into fourth position. Great stuff, we missed it, but it, but he's got past De Angelis, and De Angelis is still on the circuit, so somehow or other, Mark Sura must have got a better line, brake later, accelerated earlier, or whatever, but somehow or other, he has got ahead of Elio De Angelis and is in as far as my memory can recall, the highest position he has ever been in a Grand Prix, and there he is, number 14, Mark Sura, fourth place. Great drive. Down to fifth goes to De Angelis. In sixth position now, Jean-Pierre Jarrier. In seventh place, Jacques Lafitte. First still, Reutemann. Second still, Jones. Third still, Patrese. And I was saying I would expect now to see Alan Jones start to close up on as the two Torbots, led by Sura there in fourth position, number 14, followed by De Angelis, the right hand of the cars that we're looking at now. There's the two Torbots on the left in sixth and seventh positions as Sura accelerates away. And Jarier and Lafitte in the Torbots are closing up on De Angelis in the white helmet in the Lotus in fifth place. And Alan Jones must, I would imagine, ahead of them, be closing up on Carlos Reutemann just to say, in effect, look, uh, my friend, I am less than 10 seconds behind you. Now is your chance to move over and let me, according to the rules of our contract, the requirements of our contracts, move over and let me, Alan Jones, take the lead. That's what I expect to see. But is it going to happen? Well, we'll just have to wait as... Again, De Angelis, Gerrier, Lafitte go through. And it's Lafitte ahead now, somewhere around the circuit. Jacques Lafitte has got ahead of his teammate and is up into sixth place. De Angelis. And no words of mine can describe how tough it is for a Grand Prix driver in these circumstances with approaching 500 brake horsepower as Giacomelli goes into the pits for the fourth time in the Alfa Romeo they have some 500 horsepower underneath their right foot and Gerrier back in sixth position but that was back on lap 50 and we're ahead of that now because the computer hasn't quite caught up with what we're looking at on the screen and I'm wondering as I look at this how far Behind Alan Jones is Ricardo Patrese. If we get a long shot, look behind Alan Jones to see if you can see an, an orange and white car appear in vision, in which case it will be Ricardo Patrese, the Italian, in his arrows, in third position. 500 horsepower. A, a film of lubricant between the tyres and the circuit and that lubricant is called water and it makes it very, very difficult indeed to drive under these circumstances. And we're on about lap 60 now in this 63 lap race right down in the closing stages of the Brazilian Grand Prix of 1981 on this Rio circuit. There's De Angelis closing up on and taking Zunino as Sura. There's Sura with Nelson Piquet. Nelson Piquet dropping down the field as De Angelis passes Zunino with Gerrier right behind him. Gerrier passes at the same time. Look for the number on the car behind number 11. If you see it, it should be number 25, Jean-Pierre Gerrier, the Frenchman in the Torbert, in sixth position. Not long to go now, and Reutemann and Jones in first and second places will both be in the worrying state that you get to in the closing stages of a race. There's Sura, fourth. Piquet, who has been well and truly passed, going very slowly as the battle for fifth, led by number 11, Elio De Angelis, approaches and then swings away from us. And Jones and Reutemann 
imagining probably they're hearing noises in the cockpit that they've never heard before through their earplugs over the din that's pk pk spinning well that indicates that nelson pk when he went into the pits went on to dry tires that's to say slick tires with no tread on them and that explains why he's going so slowly he made the wrong tire choice when he came into the pits he's finding it very difficult indeed to control the brabham and he must be ruining it because nelson piquet is now out of the points and has yet to score in the world championship we finished second in 1980 don't forget and as i said earlier on alan jones and carlos reutemann will have 15 points to lead the World Championship very conclusively if they finish very shortly in the positions that they're in now. Because there is no change up front, we're looking at the battle still for fifth position, and it's still Reutemann in the closing stages, leading Jones in second place, Patrese, who we have hardly seen in third position, in fourth position, the brilliant Mark Sura, People were wondering if Mark Sura was really up to it because he had such terrible luck last season. Well, he's shown that he's well and truly up to it in this race in fourth position and still the battle for fifth between in the white helmet Elio De Angelis in the Lotus 81, in the blue car behind him in sixth place, Jean-Pierre Jarrier battling with Jacques Lafitte who is behind him. And I suspect that Jacques Lafitte is going to challenge for sixth place again shortly. There he is, he's coming out of the spray. Jack Lafitte is going to try and take his teammate and the sixth position and the last World Championship point. One point for sixth position. As Reutemann and Jones come through now. And either Reutemann hasn't had a signal from the pits telling him to give way to Alan Jones or he's decided he's not going to give way to Alan Jones because Alan is close enough for Reutemann to see him in his mirrors. Alan is certainly making his presence felt. He's much closer now than he was earlier on in the race. And he will know exactly, both of them will know exactly where they are. Look how close Alan Jones is now. There is no doubt at all about the fact that Alan Jones, I think, is saying to Reutemann, I am here, I am here. And Reutemann either hasn't had the official signal or he's decided that Jones having won at Long Beach and Reutemann having won at South Africa, incidentally, which, because of politics, was declared a non-point scoring race, Reutemann may have decided, I don't want to malign the man, but he may have decided, I am here and here I stay. Because we are almost at the end of the Grand Prix a race which Carlos Reutemann has driven a copybook race in because he took the lead right at the beginning by accelerating away ahead of the pole position man Nelson Piquet by out dragging his teammate Alan Jones by taking the lead into the first corner and he has driven in the lead for the whole 63 lap race distance. Look how close Alan Jones is. That's a lot less than 10 seconds. Almost home. Just watch and see if Patrese appears. No, he's further back. Out of vision. Unless something very, very dramatic happens, very shortly, Carlos Reutemann is going to win. There are the starting lights into the background, so he must be just about into his last lap now, ahead of Alan Jones. Yes, into the swinging right-hander. Now he goes up the straight out of this right-hander into a swinging left-hand bend at the top of the loop, then into another straight, which leads into the left-hander, these corners really unnamed at Rio, unlike most circuits. But it's a left hand here. Now, he, after this left hander, he sets himself up for a right. You can see the racing line with Alan Jones still less than 10 seconds behind him. That swinging right appears into a tight 
left-hander followed by a tiny little short straight. It's virtually a continuous left-hand bend as Reutemann puts on opposite lock, as does Alan Jones. And they are now into this long three-quarters of a mile straight. Reutemann Jones Patrese, Sura De Angelis Lafitte has gone up to sixth position. That was on the 60th lap, and we're way beyond that now, of course. PK keeping going, but you can see how much the Tyrrell of Zunino, who is on wet tyres, has closed up on the Brazilian Nelson Piquet and there is no way that Zanino it's Chiva, it's Eddie Chiva in the red helmet, the young American there is no way that Chiva good as he is would have done that if Nelson Piquet had got the right tyres on and it looks to me as though Chiva's shaping up to pass Piquet as right in the last stages of the race, Carlos Reutemann still holding his lead over Alan Jones, still Ricardo Patrese third it's going to be if they keep going the fourth successive race that the two Williams have scored maximum world championship points the same two drivers finishing in first and second places albeit Jones winning and Reutemann second at Canada at Watkins Glen and at Long Beach there is Nelson Piquet and he's managing to keep ahead of Cheever. No, as I say, Cheever's going to take him. He's, Cheever goes past. And as I was saying, there is no way that Eddie Cheever would have done that. And Sura, Mark Sura, comes up now in fourth position, about to lap Nelson Piquet. And I would doubt that Sura catches Eddie Cheever, who's coming towards us. Sura going to go through on the inside. There's Reutemann on almost home now, almost within sight as he comes down the long straight. The spectators, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And there's the chequered flag. Carlos Reutemann wins the second Grand Prix for him, and Dallin Jones finishes second. Reutemann, who won in South Africa, no points, finished second at... Ricardo Patrese finishing in third position. Keki Rosberg coming home. A brilliant achievement for the Williams team. I can't possibly overstate how good it was. First and second for the fourth Grand Prix in succession. Mark Sura, a brilliant third behind Patrese, ahead of Elio De Angelis, and Jacques Lafitte gets that last World Championship point for his sixth position. As Reutemann, no doubt, tired and wet, but he must be very happy, although I would doubt that he shows it, because uh, he is a man who is very sparing with his smiles, is Carlos Reutemann, but he's got plenty to be very, very happy about after his drive today. Whereas Alan Jones uh, would be a lot less happy, I guess. Carlos Reutemann out of the car. Has he taken first place in spite of his contract? or because he didn't receive the signal. Well, we'll know later on. I wouldn't like to be the man to talk to Alan Jones right now. There's Eddie Cheever who's finished. Carlos Reutemann walking in. Now let's see the helmet come off. And maybe he'll take his balaclava fireproof helmet off as well, and you'll get a look at what the Argentine driver's face looks like. Very wealthy man now, of course, with all his motor racing success behind him. So, Carlos Reutemann, the winner of the Brazilian Grand Prix, from Alan Jones, his teammate in second place. Ricardo Patrese, a superb third and underlining the great form that he showed in the first point-scoring Grand Prix of 1981 at Long Beach. And there they are, and it's significant that Alan Jones is not on the podium Patrese is shaking the champagne because Reutemann, in deference to his Arab sponsors, does not touch alcohol. And so, a win at Brazil again for the Williams team and for Carlos Reutemann.